Yeah, thank the program committee for giving us uh, the opportunity to present this data. Um, just going with Dr. Swanstrom, it's a, a difficult disease to treat and uh, you need like a programmatic approach to it. And uh, maybe the patients need different uh, approaches. So this is uh, total near total gastrectomy for refractory gastroparesis. Uh, no disclosures. So gastroparesis uh, is a, a fairly chronic debilitating disease, uh, presents usually with a constellation of symptoms, nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, bloating, and occasionally malnutrition. Um, the etiology is widely classified as diabetic, idiopathic, and iatrogenic. And uh, medical management is difficult. Um, usually start, we start with dietary changes. Uh, Antiemetics are used, prokinetics are used, and like the last uh, um, speaker was saying, as problems with tachyphylaxis and uh, neurologic and card cardiovascular side effects. Uh, people also use uh, neuropsychic medications like low-dose antidepressants and uh, sensory modulating techniques such as acupuncture, et cetera. So when these patients don't, um, you know, they, they're refractory to medical therapy, there's some surgical options, and they include decompressive gastrostomy, uh, feeding jejunostomies, um, gastric stimulation, uh, pyloroplasty, either performed laparoscopically or endoscopically. Uh, people have been talking about sleeve gastrectomies. There were a couple of posters last year at Sages. Uh, Ruin Y gastric bypass and uh, gastrectomy. Uh, we use gastrectomy for these patients who, uh, because we think that leaving the remnant behind um, is a problem. People have uh, continued uh, symptoms from the remnant, especially abdominal pain and bloating. So we choose uh, gastrectomy. Also, these are end-stage stomachs. Sometimes with uh, they look pretty terrible on the endoscopy, and we feel like uh, when you do a Ruin Y gastric bypass, you can't uh, perform any kind of endoscopic surveillance uh, on the stomach. So uh, we we kind of go with the gastrectomy. So uh, in terms of patient selection, we see a lot of gastroparitic patients, unfortunately, in our practice. And uh, you know, we kind of, most patients uh, previously would get, either get a pyloroplasty or a gastric uh, stimulator based on their symptom. Your nausea is very fa fairly well palliated with, uh, uh, with uh, stimulation, so we would use that uh, for a patient presenting primarily with nausea or pyloroplasty if they were not. But our present practice is to do combination therapy, um, do combined laparoscopic uh, gastric stimulation and a pyloroplasty. Uh, but patients who have severe gastritis or you know have gastric big a big gastric ulcer, or they have large J-shaped stomachs uh, who may not improve with a drainage procedure such as a pyloroplasty. If you scope them and you find a large gastric bezoar, uh, you know morbidly obese patients were primarily offered gastro, uh, gastrectomy and ruin wire reconstruction. Uh, in uh, our experience, uh, and also patients uh, uh, with failed pyloroplasty and gastric stimulation as a salvage procedure. So, it, the, starting off, this this is the sickest of the sick patients. You know, the other patients get other modalities of treatment. So, just keep that in mind. Uh, the primary tool that we used for uh, evaluating outcomes was this uh, uh, GCSI score, which the last uh, uh, speaker also presented. There are primary and secondary symptoms in a six point Likert scale going from zero, which is none, and five, which is very severe symptoms. And the primary symptoms are based mostly around nausea and vomiting, uh, fullness and early satiety and bloating. And secondary symptoms are based around abdominal pain, heartburn, chest pain, regurgitation. So all patients, uh, there are 29 patients in this study, all underwent laparoscopic uh, near total gastrectomy with a ruin y reconstruction. Uh, it was all performed laparoscopically. There were no conversions to open. Um, uh, 22 uh, females and uh, seven uh, males. You know that's usually the case. Most mostly a female-centered disease. Uh, most of the patients were idiopathic. Uh, there were some iatrogenic and some diabetic patients. And again, this is a slide that shows how these were patients are either complaining of either severe or very severe symptoms. And you can see a very high percentage of these patients uh, complained of um, um, uh, fullness and early satiety, nausea and bloating, abdominal pain. There were 65% of patients complaining of severe or very severe abdominal pain. Uh, and 96% of patients complained of one very severe or severe symptom, and 91% of patients complained of more than one symptom that was severe or very severe. So again, um, going back to the fact that these are pretty sick patients. 
Um, a lot of these patients had had some kind of a prior surgical procedure for gastroparesis. Um, most of the patients had a pyloroplasty. That was my practice earlier. Um, a lot of these patients were on uh, enteral feeding, and uh, they had decompressive G-tubes. Uh, some of the patients had uh, fundoplications with pyloroplasty. Uh, there was one patient with a prior uh, stimulator, and uh, one patient who had a prior Roux-en-Y gastric bypass who was complaining of severe abdominal pain and bloating. She would, did not want a G-tube uh, in her remnant. She just wanted her stomach out. Uh, and there was another patient who had a partial gastrectomy. Um, so um, 13 of the patients, uh, that's 44 percent, had a J-tube placed at the time of the uh, laparoscopic uh, gastrectomy, and these included six patients who were on preoperative enteral tube feeds. Uh, mean length of the procedure was about three and a half hours. Patients stayed in the hospital for about six days, um, and nine patients were readmitted within 30 days for dehydration and failure to thrive. And out of those, two patients had uh, we placed additional feeding J-tubes in the uh, post-operative period, uh, bring up, bringing up uh, the total number of patients on enteral tube feeds to 51%. Uh, uh, there was two patients who had an intra-abdominal bleed that was managed laparoscopically. One was at the uh, uh, region of the omentum, and the other patient had uh, um, along the uh, greater curve of the stomach where it used to be along the uh, short gastric vessels had a bleed. They were both managed laparoscopically. There was one patient who um, presented with a uh, intra-abdominal abscess related to the duodenal stump. Uh, we drained that laparoscopically, left the drain in place, and then slowly pulled the drain out, and she did okay. And there was another patient who developed enteritis from her uh, uh, from the J-tube feeds, uh, so we tr uh, treated uh, the patient with bowel rest. So mean duration of follow-up was nine months, uh, up to 30 months, um, and uh, uh, the, the mean GCSI score uh, dropped significantly. There's significant decreases in all their symptoms, but I just want to bring your attention to nausea, which uh, nausea and bloating, those are the two symptoms that showed the, the greatest drop in the median uh, score, and the, all these p-values are uh, um, uh, are significant, as you can see. Um, it's another way of looking at the symptoms. 72% uh, of patients uh, decreased, uh, showed, reported a decrease in nausea, and 72% of patients reported a decrease in vomiting. Uh, a little more difficult to uh, uh, palliate abdominal pain. A lot of these patients are on preoperative narcotics uh, and uh, difficult to treat. Early satiety is also another problematic uh, symptom, most may be related to the, the fact that we are uh, taking out most of their stomach. Um, Uh, Sixty-five percent of the patients had a post-operative GCSI score uh, less than 3.2. Um, uh, there's some talk of call, calling this uh, a successful outcome in medical trials, so um, that's another number to take home. Um, Ten patients, or 34 percent of patients, were on long-term enteral nutrition, and all six patients who came into the operation with on enteral nutrition um, were on long-term enteral nutrition. So that was the biggest uh, um, uh, predictor of being on uh, long-term enteral nutrition was uh, patients being who were on preoperative enteral nutrition. And there was a need for multiple uh, post-operative procedures. Um, you know, 19 patients had a single, a single repeat uh, post-operative procedure, and you can see seven patients had multiple post-operative procedures. And this is probably all related. I mean, they, they were all endoscopies and tube exchanges and things like that. So, you know, it's not like you're doing the case and you never see them again like a lap appy. These people keep coming back to you. So in conclusion, um, you know, laparoscopic near-total gastrectomy is safe. It can be performed safely, and it's effective palliative option for refractory severe gastroparesis or as a salvage option. Um, there is a potential for prolonged recovery and uh, possible need for long-term enteral nutrition. And uh, patients report significant, significant improvements in all their primary symptoms. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you for your kind attention.